My name's Don Rio. I'm one of you, along with uh, Rob Martinson and uh, Phoebe Rice. So this evening we have two uh, keynote speakers. Uh, that will be 30-minute talks each, then we'll have a break, and then Cedric's going to chair the next half of the session this evening. Uh, so the first uh, keynote speaker is Josh Dubnow. So Josh was a PhD student at Columbia and then uh, came to Cold Spring Harbor Labs to work with Tim Tully working on learning and memory in Drosophila, uh, and then uh, ended up starting a lab here to work on uh, learning memory and olfaction, and then more recently on neurodegenerative diseases and the connection to transposable elements, and then uh, really recently he moved his lab to Stony Brook. So um, with that, we'll begin. And one, one last thing just to point out, um, because the meeting's so broad, uh, Phoebe reminded me that uh, there are going to be talks with all three domains of life. Uh, we should try to have the speakers give a little bit of introduction to their system at the beginning, maybe, um, you know, short introduction so we're all on the same page. Okay. All right. I'll use this one. Right? Yeah, you can use this one. The run around again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Give me a second to wire myself up. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, it's funny, I left, I moved my lab from Cold Spring Harbor about two years ago and I think I've forgotten the feeling of giving a talk right after a Blackford meal. So <laughs> give me a minute to adjust. So what I want to tell you about um, is some of the work in my lab and it's really a pleasure um, to be able to give you um, some, of the, um, um, some of the stories that we're working on in the lab on the involvement of retrotransposons in neurodegeneration, in particular in ALS. And so when, when we think about ALS, there are a few really striking hallmarks that as I started to move into this neurodegeneration field and read the literature, really, really jumped out at me. And one of them is that for neurodegeneration in general, and for ALS in particular, the onset in the nervous system is focal. It starts either in lower motor neurons or in upper motor neurons and then spreads. The, the, the clinicians will tell you that the, the um, pathology that they observe in the patient spreads. And when you look in the brain, it looks like the pathology, the, the protein pathology that can be observed also spreads. So typically onset would be at one level, for example, of the spinal cord, and then spread um, both from lower motor neurons to upper motor neurons or in the other direction. And when people look post-mortem in brain tissue from affected patients, what they typically see in about 97% of ALS subjects is that affected brain tissue has this abnormal distribution of an RNA binding protein called TDP43. Um, so TDP43, which is shown in brown here, um, is in healthy tissue, is normally found in the nucleus. And in affected tissue, what you see is that the nucleus is cleared of TDP43 protein, and it forms these cytoplasmic inclusions that are essentially a hallmark. As I said, this is seen in about 97% of ALS cases, despite the fact that ALS is tremendously heterogeneous, both genetically and in terms of there being, being both familial and sporadic forms of the disease. So when we think about ALS, we know that the TDP43 aggregation pathology is central. And a lot of effort has gone to understand what the downstream toxic effects are. There's potentially effects of loss of a nuclear function. There's potentially effects of a toxic cytoplasmic um, uh, sort of neomorphic function, and potentially even dominant negative interfering with normal cytoplasmic roles. And when we think about the spread through the nervous system, this also is not fully understood, but what has been proposed is the idea that TDP43, which is one of these so-called prion-like proteins, may actually move from cell to cell and cross-seed the pathology and that somehow that may underlie the focal onset and then the spread through the nervous system. And what I want to tell you today is not that those ideas are wrong, 
but that we think we have um, uh, some new findings that, that impact the way we think about both of these features, both what the toxic effect of the aggregation pathology might be, and perhaps um, some insight into how this pathology might spread from cell to cell. So let me state what we call the retrotransposon storm hypothesis, and then I want to take you quickly through a summary of published findings from my lab and from some other labs, and I want to tell you a, a, an unpublished story. So we believe that TDP43 protein aggregation pathology synergizes with the normal effects of age to cause a morbid loss of the normal systems that silence retrotransposons in neurons and or glial cells, and that this results in a toxic wave or storm of retrotransposon expression and replication, um, and that this may have a myriad um, forms of toxic cellular effects leading to cell death, and further that this effect has a local onset followed by a spread through the CNS um, via a non-cellotonomous and self-amplifying toxicity. So I want to give you the sort of backdrop to the unpublished work that I'm going to tell you. There have been a series of papers from a number of different groups that have, that have impacted our thinking and that I think contribute to the context. Um, my lab published in 2013 a finding that retrotransposons, some retrotransposons, become increasingly expressed and even potentially actively mobile in neurons, we reported at that time, in fruit flies as they age. And this fell within a context of simultaneous literature from a number of different groups in which it was found that retrotransposon expression and perhaps even replication may be a hallmark of aging across a variety of tissues and species. Um, in collaboration with Molly Hamill's lab, we then looked at TDP43, just doing a computational analysis of published um, deep sequencing um, data sets and found evidence that TDP43 might actually bind normally to retrotransposon RNAs and may lose that association in um, tissue from um, uh, patients with TDP43-related neurodegeneration. In parallel, Avi Nath's group at the NIH published a series of very interesting papers establishing that a particular endogenous retrovirus, HERV-K, in humans is expressed in some ALS patients, and in fact, he published this startling paper that um, provided strong evidence that HERV-K um, proteins may be toxic to neurons both in cell culture and when expressed in mice, in fact, leading to a motor neuron disease. Um, and in parallel, literature has been emerging more recently suggesting that expression of retrotransposons may be correlated with a suite of other neurodegenerative disorders. So how do we model these diseases in animals? The problem is that the majority of ALS patients, about 90%, are sporadic. There's no known mutation. TDP43 protein of normal amino acid sequence accumulates in the cytoplasm and forms these inclusions and initiates this pathology. Um, so how do we model that? It takes decades to appear sporadically in humans. And really, um, a conceptual framework for how to do this has come from some recent literature that has emerged from a, a variety of places suggesting that these low-complexity domain-containing proteins have a propensity to undergo phase transitions that is both temperature, as you see here, and concentration dependent. And this is shown for HNRNPA1, but similar findings have been um, demonstrated for TDP43. And what you see is that when you lower the temperature or when you raise the concentration of the protein, or in fact stimulated by binding to RNA, you see this um, spontaneous formation of, these, uh, of this sort of phase transition. And, and what's thought now is that the longer the protein spends in this form, the more likely it is to undergo amyloidogenesis and perhaps form irreversible um, inclusions such as, are, as are, is seen in human tissues. And what's interesting is that the normal nuclear um, accumulation of the protein is, as I said, now um, cleared out and you see this aggregation pathology in the cytoplasm. And the important thing to keep in mind is that one of the nuclear roles of TDP43 is to autoregulate. It normally represses its own expression by affecting a splicing change of the primary transcript 
um, in the nucleus. And so when you lose that autoregulatory feedback inhibition, this would be associated with a runaway overexpression of the protein. And together, this really forms the key insight, which is that by overexpressing the protein transgenically, either in cells, grown in culture, or in tissues of organisms, we might be able to reproduce some of this phenomenology. And in fact, it's true. In animal models where you increase the expression levels of TDP43, you see pathological, pathological cytoplasmic inclusions resulting in toxicity to both glia and neurons. We see age-dependent neurodegenerative effects, and people have then used these contexts to study the potential impacts and found roles for TDP43 in all sorts of aspects of RNA biology, splicing, mRNA stability, micro microRNA biogenesis, and then as we demonstrated in 2017, um, um, impact on siRNA functional efficacy and activation of retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses. So here's just an example from our 2017 paper of the fly version of this model. Other labs have actually done this um, kind of a, approach as well before we did overexpressing TDP43 leading to pathology. And you can just see using an antibody against a hyperphosphorylid form of TDP43 that normally is only seen in diseased tissue from patients, you see that this phosphoform accumulates and in fact is cleared from the nucleus which is stained with DAPI and the green fluorescence is the TDP43 protein. Okay, so we and many other labs have used this overexpression model. And what we found in Drosophila when we do this is that this leads to a wholesale, wholesale loss of efficacy of siRNA-mediated transposon silencing. And what we see with RNA sequencing experiments, such as the one I'm showing you here, is that in either the context of pan-neuronal overexpression of TDP43 or pan-glial overexpression, we see an upregulation of many transposon sequences. Some of the ones that are overexpressed with glial expression and neuronal expression are the same. Some are different. There are ones that are specific to the neuronal context, and there are ones that are specific to the glial context. And what I'll tell you about today is this one here, Gypsy, which we focused on both because it is one of the uh, transposable elements for which there are the best tools, and also because it is one of the most aggressively active transposons in neural tissue. And in fact, we had demonstrated in a previous paper that Gypsy retrotransposon, an LTR retrotransposon, is capable of fully um, replicating in neuro post mitotic neurons. And I just want to say that you should visit poster, I think I got the number correctly, poster 35. Um, this is uh, just one image from a collaboration that really is led by Molly Hamill's lab, but in collaboration with my own lab, with John Ravitz's lab, and with Hamali Fatnani at the New York Genome Center as part of this big ALS consortium to do RNA sequencing on multiple brain regions and tissues from ALS patients. And I just want to make the point that humans are a good model for Drosophila because we see that in um, a fairly um, significant fraction of ALS subjects, we see what looks like a transposon storm that looks similar to what we see in the flies, at least at the expression level. So as I said, we focused on Gypsy. Um, when we overexpress TDP43 in glial cells, we see this really disastrous effect on the organisms. So this is median survival of wild-type animals, about 63 days. Um, this is what happens when we express TDP43, leading to this kind of pathology in glial cells. And when we express an RNAi transgene to knock down just Gypsy, we have this pretty remarkable restoration of lifespan. We also showed in that 2017 paper that we reduced the amount of tunnel labeling, suggesting that we're reducing the amount of cell death. And we wanted to get a mechanism at that time, and we used a trick, the, um, the so-called Loki gene, named after the Norse trickster god. Loki in flies codes for CHECK2, and it is thought, so CHECK2 is a signaling molecule that detects DNA damage and signals for apoptosis. And, we, and it is known that in the context of germline, if you reduce CHECK2 signaling, you actually partially ameliorate the effects, the toxicity of retrotransposon um, expression. And so when we knock down the level of Loki, we see this remarkable restoration of lifespan in animals that have this aggressive TDP43 pathology compared to um, a overexpression of a control uh, RNAi. So at that time, 
This is the way we thought about this. We proposed in, 20, in this 2017 paper that you have various forms of uh, insults that can cause DNA damage. When cells have DNA damage, they can go to a, a number of different pathways. And what we proposed is that TDP43 interfered with silencing mechanisms, giving overexpression of endogenous retroviruses and retrotransposons. We focused in particular on Gypsy, and we said Gypsy must be causing DNA damage, and that must be leading to DNA damage-mediated apoptosis, because when we knock down CHECK2, we can restore um, a lot of function to these animals. And after I gave a talk where I sort of presented this idea at the Keystone meeting last year, um, John Moran came over to me and we had a conversation. And uh, he wasn't smiling, actually. <laughs> and he said, he said, Josh, he said, I, I don't like the idea that Gypsy is causing DNA damage because, you know, the integrase is so effective that it's not going to abort very much. You're not going to get a lot of DNA damage. And I argued, but yeah, we have this check two result. We knock out check two, and the animals are just so happy. And um, that conversation stuck with me. And what I want to tell you are the results from experiments that we had initiated before that conversation and some that we initiated because of that conversation. And I want to tell you how they turned out. So what we realized is that we had to look more carefully at each of these levels. If DNA damage is being caused by Gypsy, then we should see evidence that Gypsy is fully replicating. We should be able to see DNA damage, and we should be able to see activation of caspase cascade leading to cell death. And um, in order to do this, we had to design a reporter. Um, this reporter system we call Cellular Labeling of Endogenous Virus Replication, or CLEVER. Uh, Gypsy Clever's design works as follows. We take advantage of a quirk of LTR retrotransposon or retrovirus replication. The LTRs are direct repeats, but I've color-coded them so you can see where the information comes from. And after this virus replicates, it actually templates some of the 5' prime LTR from the 3' prime LTR and some of the 3' prime LTR from the 5' prime LTR. And so we put a GAL4 responsive promoter with no reporter in the five prime end and positioned appropriately a reporter with no promoter at the three prime end. And so after reintegration, it should put the UAS response element that responds to GAL4 instead in front of the reporter. And as a reporter, we used a two floor four trick that has membrane GFP, a T2A followed by nuclear M cherry. Um, when Rich Keegan, who is shown here, a PhD student in the lab, put this construct into S2 cells. Indeed, we can see this, what he calls watermelon label, where you have a red um, M. cherry label in the nucleus and green um, around the membrane. And um, Rich and a postdoc in the lab, um, Yung Heng Chang, who we affectionately call forever, did a lot of molecular confirmation to show that this is really rearranging the way you would expect. And if you make mutations in the primer binding site, you don't see it, and so on. So then forever put this in vivo. And what he did here is he used an inducible expression of TDP43. So you turn TDP43 on at time zero in adults. And what happens is you turn it on in glia, and you see this disastrous neurodegenerative effect, and the animals die within less than 10 days. And then he looked two, three, four, or five days after induction. And, it, and he looked at the M cherry label that tells you that the gypsy re, um, reporter has replicated. And in control animals that just express LAC-Z instead of TDP43, you don't see any. Um, Forever showed in a separate series of experiments that if you let these essentially wild-type animals get very old, you do start to see replication. But in this time course of five days after induction of TDP43 or LAC-Z, you don't see it. He used a marker called REPO, which labeled the, nu the, the glial nuclei, and you can see the stable expression of the marker. Now, when TDP43 is induced, we see over the several days after induction a pretty massive upregulation of the gypsy replication reporter. And when he co-labeled with this glial marker, you see something pretty remarkable. The marker seems to be lost over the next several days. So this is um, Forever's um, in vivo work. Um, and so then the question is, OK, gypsy is replicating. Is it actually causing DNA damage? And so he used this gamma H2AV marker that marks, uh, histone variant that marks um, DNA damage foci. And what you can see is that in the control 
um, animals. At day three or day four, you don't see any evidence for H2AV labeling, and you don't see evidence for gypsy clever replication. But when you have TDP43 induced, you see, as I showed you previously, this pretty massive upregulation of gypsy replication in glia, and I hope you can see that there's a quite a lot of DNA of evidence for DNA damage. So it's replicating and it's causing, or it's replicating and it's correlated with DNA damage. What about cell death? So uh, what Forever did is use this reporter system that was generated by another group. The venous fluorophore is tethered to the membrane by a domain from PARP that is cleaved by activated caspase 3. So when it is cleaved, it activates this epitope for cleave PARP for which there's a good antibody and it releases venous from the membrane and allows it to fill the, the cytosol. So what you see over here is a confocal section from healthy tissue in red. I keep fixing this nuclei uncle thing and it keeps reappearing because I grab an old slide. I fixed that 10 times. Um, so in red, we're labeling, or forever is labeling, all of the glial nuclei. And in blue, in bright, dark blue, he's labeling all of the neuronal nuclei. There is no C-PARP here because there's no cell death. It's healthy tissue. And the venous is all at the membrane. Now importantly, this venous is expressed only in the red glial cells, but it forms these beautiful honeycomb-like membrane structures because the glia have these massive membrane structures that enwrap all of the tissue. So all of that green is coming from these red cells. And what Forever did is to then take this reporter and to overexpress either LAC-Z or TDP43. These are days post-induction. And what I hope you can see is that by day three, there's this massive activation of the PARP signal, which is the cleaved um, epitope, and um, uh, redistribution of venous from the membranes into the cytosol as well. And you don't see this in wild type animals. The other thing you'll notice is that this red label that labels the glial nuclei seems to be going away and hold that thought. So there is cell death of the glial cells. Um, to give you a sense of the timing, this is just before the animals crash, before they die. And um, again, when we think about this, we still place this into the context of our original model. Gypsy replicates, we see DNA damage, we see apoptosis. It's induced by TDP43 pathology, and when we knock out check two, we restore function. But we started to get a hint of some interesting things that made us question this idea. So what I'm showing you here is Forever's quantification of the number of glial cells, and you see this loss. You saw the loss of the red marker. We see this induction of a wave of um, the PARP signal by day three, and then as the cells are lost, it goes away, and the same with the venous marker. And when Forever counted the number of neuronal nuclei, he saw that indeed the number of neurons were lost as well. Around the time that the glia crash, you start to see neurons being lost as well. And when he looked with an activated caspase 3 antibody, in fact, he could see um, that in compared to controls, when you overexpress TDP43, at this day three case, you can really see it. Here are some glial nuclei that are labeled with activated caspase 3, and there's a neuronal nucleus nearby that is also dying by apoptosis. So that's non-cell autonomous, and it's really consistent with the literature that has emerged in the ALS field, in which it is found that astrocytes from patients become toxic to the, the motor neurons that they're in contact with. But one problem is that glial cells are also nurturers. And so in the absence of glial cells, we show, I showed you how much glial cell death there is, you might lose neurons merely because they're losing the nurturers. So that's the Ruth Bader Ginsburg has retired model. The alternative is that they become toxic entities and that they're <laughs> secreting something dangerous and killing the neighboring neurons. And Forever got at this in a few different ways. One is, he used promoter lines that are specific for different subsets of glia. So we have these perineural and subperineural glia that are up at the surface, the so-called cortical glia that are down surrounding the neuronal nuclei or, or, somatic, or neuronal somata. We have these astrocyte-like glia that are deeper in the brain and also the ensheathing glia. So here's a GAL4 line that drives GFP in subperineural glia or cortical glia or astrocyte-like glia. So we have all the tools to do this. And what Forever found is that when he puts TDP43 just in these subperineural glial cells, 
that you can see caspase labels. So this is just below the plane of focus of, of this um, image. You can see caspase label in blue nuclei. Those are labeled with a neuronal marker. And these neurons are dying because they're near these glia that are expressing um, TDP43 proteinopathy. And here's other examples as you go deeper into the tissue. The second way he did this is with mosaic analysis. So using flip recombination approaches, he was able to just turn on TDP43 proteinopathy in small groups of cells near the end of development. And he observed these are small groups of astrocyte-like glia or perineural glia, for example. And you see neurons nearby dying. And you, when you count this, you see that in 11 out of 11 perineural glial clones, you see nearby ne neurons dying. Um, all of the subperineural and ones that we couldn't distinguish had the same effect. And about half of the subperineural glial clones also had nearby neurons dying. And we also see this with astrocyte-like glia. But this is not just an effect of killing cells, because if you turn on HID to cause apoptosis in these various glial cell types, you don't see any cases where neighboring neurons are dying. He can also establish that it is the expression, or sorry, the replication of gypsy that predicts whether a glial cell and a nearby neuron will die. So red shows the gypsy replication reporter, green shows all glial nuclei, and blue shows neuronal nuclei, and white is caspase. So here's a green cell, that's a glial cell nucleus, but gypsy has not replicated, and there's no caspase. And here's one where it's replicated, and here's one where it's replicated, and here's a nearby neuron that's dying. And in fact, it is the cells in which gypsy is replicating that have the DNA damage. So here is a glial cell that's marked with the gypsy replication reporter, and I hope you can see the DNA damage foci. And here is a glial cell that is not marked by the gypsy replication reporter, and you don't see DNA damage. Um, the gypsy express, expression in glia kills nearby neurons because if we knock down the levels of gypsy with an RNAi transgene, we reduce the amount of, cas, of caspase label. And this is quantified here. And if you knock down CHECK2, Loki, you reduce the signaling to P53 and you also rescue the neighboring neurons. So, so far, we're still kind of thinking, okay, this kind of still fits our model. And it's just that we've added this effect of killing neighboring neurons. You knock down levels of gypsy, you have less neuronal, in glia, you have less neuronal apoptosis. Knock down the levels of CHECK2 in glia, less neuronal apoptosis. But Forever did a very clever experiment. He said, what would happen if I directly inhibited caspase 3 downstream with overexpression of these molecules, which are known to bind to caspase and inhibit its function? And when he did that, he got a big surprise. So this is now overexpression of P35 or overexpression of DIAP. And I hope you can see you have this pretty dramatic upregulation of the number of cells, which I'll show you quantification in a minute, that are labeled with caspase 3. Interestingly, he rescues the glial marker. You see how the glial marker is going away by day four here? But when he drives inhibitors of caspase 3 in glia, the glia survive longer but they're killing more neurons. So this is quantified here. Total number of glia drops, but if you overexpress P35 or DIAP, you reduce the amount of toxicity to glia. Total number of neurons drops a little, but if you overexpress these inhibitors of caspase 3, you make it worse. You actually lose more neurons. So you're rescuing the glia, but you're killing the neurons. And you can see this when you look at caspase positive neurons. There's actually an increase in the number of neurons that are labeled with caspase. So now returning to this model, there's a problem. If we inhibit here, things are much better for the animal and for the cells and for the neighboring neurons. If we inhibit down here, we rescue the glia, and that kills more neurons. And what that says is that something else is going on with CHECK2. When CHECK2 function is disrupted, we stop the cells from dying, but we also prevent them from releasing some toxic entity that they would need to kill the neighboring neurons. And because we think this is gypsy, we went and looked at gypsy levels. And indeed, when you knock down CHECK2 with this RNAi transgene, the amount of gypsy ENV that we can detect drops dramatically. And the almost inescapable conclusion of this 
is that John should smile because it says that DNA damage activating check two is upstream of Gypsy. We knock out check two and we lose Gypsy. We lose the toxic entity that kills nearby neurons. But when we inhibit caspase three, check two is still inhibiting. Uh, uh, check two is still, is, it's the loss of check two that leads to Gypsy. So when we knock down caspase three, we're still getting retrotransposons expressed and killing neighboring neurons. But the whole thing is started by TDP43 proteinopathy, which we've shown blocks the normal silencing mechanisms that keep retrotransposons in check. On the other hand, I also showed you that it is the expression of TDP43 that is somehow causing the DNA damage. And in fact, cell by cell, it is the cells where Gypsy is replicating where we see that DNA damage, those DNA damage foci occurring. So I have to still wonder whether there may also be some effect. Perhaps it's not the LTR retrotransposons. Perhaps it's the other retrotransposons, the line-like elements that may be causing the DNA damage. So I think I've, to, I don't, I'm basically out of time. I think I've told you everything, the whole summary I've already said. The only thing I'll add is that, uh, um, where is it? Here, there's one result that's on this list that I didn't show you is that Gypsy can transfer its genetic material through a 0.4 micron filter. So although we have not shown this, we don't know what the toxic entity is that is released from glial cells onto neurons. We of course love the idea that it's some um, viral movement of gypsy from glial cells to neurons, but that remains to be determined. Um, and then acknowledgments. So Rich Keegan is the one who did the S2 cell work that I showed you, but pretty much all of the non-cell autonomous in vivo stuff was done by this really awesome postdoc uh, forever. Um, I should say that uh, Jorge, a postdoc in the lab, and Inas, a technician in the lab, have a poster number 19 that I urge you to visit. They are um, attempting to develop a toolbox for manipulating and observing retrotransposons in flies. Um, and also um, a collaborator, Molly Hamill, who um, really has taken the lead on looking at human tissue. Um, and her lab has a number of posters that I would urge you to visit as well. And please vote on Tuesday. <laughs>
transgene cannot be packed into the No, I because think it's a technical thing. So the, the reporter system that we have puts the promoter next to the reporter after replication. But the promoter we have on there is a GAL4 responsive promoter. So it only turns on if there's GAL4 in the cell, and we're using GAL4 to put TDP43 in the glia. So we couldn't, be, we couldn't see it if it moved to neurons. So there are um, you know, obvious solutions yeah. to that, but that tool, for technical reasons, doesn't let us answer that. Yeah, so is Henry. it possible that the overexpression of TDP43 is affecting or inactivating CHECK2? It, it's a really interesting idea. Um, the way. We don't have any evidence. I'll tell you what my thinking is. My thinking is that when a cell has DNA damage and wants to die by apoptosis, it says, come on, transposons, do it for me. That, that's, what I, that's my favorite model. <laughs> and so, and so um, check two signaling may be stimulating, may, may be interfering with something that normally silences transposons. It may be, I, I, you know, I have no evidence for this, but that's my personal love story um, model, is that, you know, that, that retrotransposons have become a, a way to help cells die when they want to. But, you know, you could think, you could think of 10 other models. That doesn't have to be the right model. Yeah. Here. Uh. So Josh, very nice talk. Um, so I guess the question would be, is how do you know that the overexpression of TD P43 uh, and retrotransposon expression rising, that they're just correlated. That um, basically you're loosening up chromatin, God knows what, and that, that's the escape mechanism yeah. for the expression of retrotransposons. Do you have anything to what that? Yeah, the, the, only, the only evidence, so in the human, we don't know. In the fly, if we inhibit gypsy expression, we, we reduce DNA damage, we reduce cell death, we extend the lifespan of the animals. So that's, okay. so that's our evidence. Um, yeah, but, you know. And that's all done in the presence of overexpressed TDP. Yeah, yeah. Here, on the back, here. So one of the, one of the uh, byproduct of uh, LTR retrotransposons and uh, retrovirus replication is circular DNA. So, uh, and I'm wondering uh, if the Clever system would be able to distinguish between integrated uh, retrotransposons and yeah. uh, these circular DNA forms. And one correlate of this question is that um, check two might be required to, f to make these forms. So, I'm wondering if it couldn't explain the phenotype. So, so, I guess formally, with the Clever system, we only know that we got a DNA copy that can be expressed. That's all we know. So if there are circular DNAs that then get transcribed and make, you know, the reporter, we can't prove that that's, you know, we can't rule that out. Um, as for check two, when you knock check two down, um, you, su you suppress the toxicity and you reduce the level of, in of endogenous gypsy expression. Do you think you will see the same phenotype with uh, integrase min minus uh, uh, gypsy? Um, we can't make, we, of course, we can't make a strain in which all the copy, endogenous copies are integrase minus, but, but with the reporter system, we can do structure functions, so we could do those kinds of, we haven't, but we could do those kinds of experiments. But of course, we, we can't, engineer all the copies in the yeah, genome. But sure. in the context of the reporter, that would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. All right, thanks.